Can you give us Numbers 23, 19? It says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. He said, has he said it? Will he not make it to pass? Has he spoken? Will he not make it come to pass? Since just for a few seconds this morning, I want you to ask God, what is that thing that keeps you up at night? What is that thing you're trusting the Almighty God for in 2022? God cannot lie. He cannot fail. Commit it to the Almighty God today and say, Father, I'm trusting you for this in the area of my career, in the area of my health, in the area of my finances, in the areas of my marriage, in the area of my ministry, in the area of my children, commit it to the hands of the Almighty and ask the Lord, Father, I will not be put to shame. My family will not be put to shame. My home will not be put to shame. That which you have spoken over me, it shall come to pass. I align with your word in Philippians 4, 13. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I believe that very soon you'll come to give a testimony in the assembly of the righteous concerning how God intervened in your personal situation. So shall it be in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, choir. God bless you. Hallelujah. So this afternoon, because it's noon already, I'm going to continue uh, with the monthly theme that we've been going through, Transformed Lives series. And as part of that general Transformed Lives, I'm going to be talking about successful transformation requires discipline and consistency. Somebody say discipline. Somebody say consistency. Successful transformation requires discipline and consistency. Father, I, I commit this teaching into your hands. Take me out of the way. Holy Spirit, teach your people out of the volume of your books. Father, even as I open my mouth, oh God, fill it with your words. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, O oh God, be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The text that we've been looking at has been Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In New King James, please, if you give me New King James uh, this afternoon, that will be perfect. I might be reading some text from NLT, but uh, most of the ones I can quote will be New King James. Again, I read Romans 12, 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I was looking at the word transform. And the word transform can mean different things. Transform can mean to change something. It can mean to renovate something. It can mean to improve something. It can mean to alter and it can be like a, like a makeover. So when I got to the word makeover, I had to pause for a second. And I looked at makeover, especially the way some of our women do makeover. Say amen, somebody. Uh, makeover, when you talk about makeover, makeover means involves changing the hairstyle, changing makeup, changing the clothes. And... You know, if some men are not careful, you, by the time your wife does a makeover, you can walk by, past her by the mall because she has really transformed. <laughs> Hallelujah. In fact, on a, on a lighter side, there was this man who got married. And after the honeymoon, he said he wanted to file for divorce. So they asked him what happened. 
He said, before he got married, he never saw his wife without makeup. And that when he went on honeymoon, uh, the morning after, that somebody appeared from the bathroom and he said, hello, what are you doing in this room? And he said, I'm your wife. He said, but this makeup that you've had has transformed you. So I really didn't know. So men, before you marry, make sure you see your bride to be bef bef without makeup. Otherwise, divorce will not be your portion in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you watch HGTV, where they, they deal with properties, you know that uh, there are a lot of developers there, like the Br Property Brothers and all that. And what a developer typically does is that they will take a home, uh, they will transform it, they will change it, they will improve it, and then they sell it you know, for a good price, they make profit on it. But there's also an interesting part of uh, this HGTV. Uh, my wife likes to watch HGTV, so I, I sit with her and sometimes spend quality time. And I, one thing that actually intrigues me uh, is not when the developer is selling the property to another person, but when the developer is embanking on a project for the current owner of the property. So what happens is that uh, in some cases, in many of these cases, the owner of the property will have to move out for my, a couple of months while the developer will rip out the bathroom, take out the dining room, change the kitchen, just change everything internally about the property and sometimes externally. And I'm always intrigued when the owners come back to the property and they are amazed. They walk through the living room and they, they, usually there will be couples the husband will ask the wife, is this really a home? Because the house has been what? It has been transformed. And usually it's like a three to six month project. And I was thinking in my spirit, wouldn't it be wonderful as believers that we look inwards and we think, you know, I know I'm saved because if I wasn't saved, the way you just talked to me, I would have reacted. How many of you know that when you are saved, you know you are really saved? Because the things that you used to do, you don't do it anymore. But when it comes to property, most of those transformation projects are like three to six month projects. But do you know that the transformation of a believer is a lifelong project? Hello? Because I know because I'm a work in progress. I don't know about you. If you have completely transformed, please pray for me. I'm, I'm a work in project. I'm a work in progress. Uh, and I know it, so I'm always particular. I'm always trying to learn, trying to m improve on myself. You know, I know that there's some believers, they, I call them AMFM believers. They, they change frequency on God. So they change frequency, they tune to God. Uh, Sunday mornings between 11 and, two, and 1, one thirty, they hear from God. And then once they leave the church, they switch back their frequency to the secular and they don't hear from God. You know, the interesting thing about life is that there are three types of people. There are three people you cannot fool. First of all, you, you cannot fool God. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.19, it says, nevertheless... The solid foundation of God stands. God knows those who are his. Let everyone that mentions the name of God depart from what? Iniquity. Which means you can come to church, you can have an appearance of being transformed, but you can't fool God. The other person you cannot fool is Satan, the enemy, because he knows those who are God's. And of course, you cannot fool yourself. So today, I challenge and I encourage you, you know, if you are like an AM, FM Christian, and the Bible puts it this way, it says, these people, they worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So sometimes you say, hey, brother, are you? I'm blessed and highly favored. But you just fought with your wife, even up to the car park of the church, and then you say you're blessed and highly favored. You're still cursing out at work. You're still lying on your taxes. You are doing, still doing all these sort of things. You're worshiping God with your lips, but your heart is far from God. 
May the Lord help you and all of us in Jesus' mighty name. So like I emphasize, the believer's transformation is not like a developer's transformation on a, at least a residential property. It's not a three to six month project. It's a, a lifetime project. And that brings a lot of challenges. And I, I caution you, no matter your position or your title in ministry, whether you're an apostle, whether you're a general overseer, whether you're a pastor, an elder, a deacon, there's always something or somebody that knows how to push your button. Hello? There's always something or somebody that knows how to antagonize you. And the challenge is that when those buttons are being pushed or when you are being antagonized, uh, this is not the year to fly off the handle. This is the year to be slow to speak. This is the year to be quick to listen. And this is the year to let your anger subside. And the Lord will help you in Jesus' name. So there are two types of transformation. There's one where you surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And there's one that's superficial. You have an appearance of godliness, but you do not actually follow God. Let's look at the transformation journey. If an expert were to give you an advice on something, you are going to, you're bound to listen to that expert, aren't you? So, for example, if Warren Buffett was to give you advice on which stocks to pick, you know he's a seasoned investor, you are bound to listen to him because he's an expert in that area. If Jeff Bezos of Amazon was going to, or he wrote a book on how to have a successful online business and you're interested in selling your services or your product online, you're going to look at that book and say, what nuggets can I pick from this? Because you want to sell your services or your product. If Tom Brady, for, for the of us that follow American football, is one of the greatest quarterbacks, if he was to write a book on how to be successful in the NFL, and you're interested in football career, you're going to pick it up and look at it. If somebody has a blog on living healthy, and you look at their profile, they say they're 60 years old, but they look like they're 35 or 40, you want to listen to them because, they say, well, I see this working for you, therefore let me find out uh, what this man or woman is saying. So this afternoon, I want you to listen to somebody that is, in my opinion, the second most important person in the New Testament after Jesus Christ, where we measure the volume and the relevance of his letters and teaching. And of course, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul is an expert by the grace of God, uh, because he gave his life, and from his teaching, we saw that he led a surrendered life. And so when I was looking at how do we have a consistent, transformed life, I look at Romans seven fifteen, and Apostle Paul is an expert in this area. And then he says something that is very profound. He says, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Now, what the apostle is trying to get us to realize is that the successful Christian transformation does not happen easily. It's a lifelong effort. We are always a work in progress. You know, sometimes you ask yourself, you process things, and you say, why am I like this? You might be saved, but your mouth is not saved. Hello? Because sometimes you find yourself saying things and say, why did I say this to my spouse? Why did I say this to my co-workers? Why did I say this to my children? And then you remember that I'm a work in progress, and I try to continue to improve on my life. And the apostle encourages us. He says, even for him, 
He says sometimes that the things that he wants to do, he knows what is right. But instead of doing that thing, he finds his flesh controlling him and he does what he hates. And then, as if to warn us, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, therefore, let him who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. Because he realizes that even within the body, there are some people that all they do is criticize other people. Say, so how could Sister Mercy have done that? How could Brother Timothy have done that? Now, he's warning them that you are standing simply by the grace of God. So don't be quick to criticize other people. Instead of criticizing them, can you just pray for them? Hello? Can you just pray for me? And then the Bible tells us that in Matthew 24, 13, that he who endures to the end will be saved. He says the love of many will grow cold. And I thought about this. For something to grow cold, it suggests that it was hot before. Just like when people get married and they go on honeymoon. Before, and after, before the honeymoon or during the honeymoon, the, how many of you know that the love is always hot? But when you get back to reality and the bills come and the challenges of life comes, sometimes the love might wane a bit, but by the grace of God, it will pick up and grow hot again in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And then he says something, just again to emphasize, you know, that transformation for a believer is not a, a single event. It's not a one-day event. It's a continuous process. And so, when you fall, even as you struggle, just be encouraged that as long as you are genuinely saved, you have surrendered to the leading of the Holy Spirit, you are not going to arrive at the destination of being perfect in one day. It takes a lifetime journey. And this scripture that I'm sharing with you now in 1 Corinthians 9, 27 uh, it's something that when I read, because I know the commitment of Apostle Paul is tenacity, is passion for ministry. Uh, he says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should do. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might be disqualified. Now, I know that many of our young men aspire to be in sports, professional athletes. They look at people like LeBron James. They look at people like, I guess, well, old school will look at uh, uh, MJ. And then they look at, you know, Steph Curry and all the current crop and say, well, I, I wish my game can be like that. But saints, do you know that no matter how much natural gift those people have, they train very hard to always be on top of their game. You'll be amazed. And that's why the Bible also tells us as believers, it says, tear up the gift of God that is in you. No matter how much the gift is in you, until you discipline like an athlete to train it, it's highly unlikely that you will be at the top of your game. And therefore, when the Apostle Paul is giving us this analogy that I, I discipline myself, May I suggest to you, too, that you discipline yourself, discipline your mouth, discipline your tongue, discipline your attitude to walk, to ministry. Discipline the way your emotions sometimes run, that you say things. And you know, the words that we sometimes speak, they are like eggs. Once you throw an egg on the floor, what happens? It breaks, and it's difficult for you to pick up from there. So this year, I'm challenging you that discipline and consistency are required in order to have a successful, transformed life. But I know some of you are thinking in your heart and say, Pastor, thank God I'm not a preacher. Because I think that this scripture applies to preachers. Well, let me just tell you one thing this afternoon. You don't need to hold the microphone and be on the pulpit in order to preach. When you're shouting at your spouse, you're preaching to your children. When you're cursing out in the car, you're preaching to the people that are sitting with you in the car. 
when you have outbursts of anger, you're preaching to people in your area of influence. So when the Bible says, Paul speaking, that I discipline myself so that after I've preached to others, it's not necessarily just extending to somebody standing on the pulpit like me this afternoon and preaching. It's talking about in your personal life. How do you treat your children? How do you talk to your wife? How do you talk to your husband? Whenever you're doing that in your home, you're preaching to your children. When you do that in the workplace, you're preaching to the people that are around you. When you go out to a restaurant and you're cursing out among your friends, you're preaching to the friends that you have gone to eat. May the Lord give us wisdom in Jesus' mighty name. You know, when the, the Bible talks in Romans 12:2 that we must renew our mind, we must renew our mind. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word renewing is a continuous tense, which means it's something you do on a regular basis. So just because your mind was renewed last night doesn't mean that today you don't have challenges. You get up, you have to continue to renew your mind. Because there's a principle that where the mind goes, the body what? Follows. Which is whatever you think first, the body will follow it and will obey it. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, it says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As you think in your heart, so are you. You know, if you wake up on Sunday morning and your spouse asks you a question, let's say your spouse will ask you, is it in the Bible for us to go to church every Sunday? You know she's going here or she's going somewhere with that. <laughs> what they are saying is that, honey, I woke up this morning, but my mind is telling me that maybe church is not that compulsory. All of a sudden, they began to sound very philosophical. Because after all, we have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have live stream. So do we really have to show up in church? Now watch this. Their mind, when they woke up, is undecided. And therefore, their body is ready to follow wherever the mind goes. As you think in your heart, so are you. And since the reason I'm emphasizing this is that it's important for us to make sure that we don't let negative, ungodly thoughts dwell in our mind. You know, they say you can't control a bird flying over your head, but you can certainly control them building a nest over your head. Which means... Sometimes you have flashes of ungodly thought. You have flashes of things in your mind that are not going to necessarily allow you to work well. But then if you dwell or you re on these thoughts and you allow them to build up in your heart, those thoughts can lead you astray. Remember, wherever the mind goes, the body follows. No matter what you have been destined for, you might have been destined for greatness. Like Samson, well, whenever he saw a beautiful woman, his mind would go, I want to lay with her, and that led to his downfall. No matter the call of God over your life, your mind is very important. May the Lord grant you the grace to control your thoughts, to have godly thoughts, thoughts that will progress and move you forward in Jesus' name. The way we think determines how we live. The way we think determines who we are. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, Proverbs 4.23, it says, guard your heart, your mind above all else, for it determines the course of your life. You know, there's a lady, Joyce Myers, she calls it stinking thinking. Stinking thinking. Do you know that if you continue to have low thoughts about yourself, you develop what I call low self-esteem. No matter what God has ordained for you. And we see that in the book of Judges. The angel went to a man called Gideon and called him mighty man of valor. But because of Gideon's thinking, he couldn't see what God saw in him. He believed that the, his circumstances, his surroundings controlled his future. 
I have a word for somebody this afternoon. No matter how tough things might be today, your future is glorious in Jesus' name. So I need you to reach out and continue to believe the word of God over your life. The Bible says you are the head and not the tail. You are above only and not beneath. If God has spoken it, just like Chizoram was leading us in that special number, he will make it to pass in Jesus' mighty name. You know, that's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, it says, for we do not, says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Saints, your mind can become a stronghold. I remember clearly many years ago that we were canceling this couple. They had been married for about 20 years, and they, all of a sudden they started having challenges. So we brought both of them together, the husband and the wife. And of course, every marriage has challenges, and it's only by the grace of God that all of us are standing so in our opinion, I was just a deacon in the church then, uh, the, the issue was not particularly difficult. But one thing I observed, and I don't know whether this is peculiar to women, the wife in that case had made up her mind that there was no going back to that marriage. Her mind had become a stronghold. So when we cancel them, we say, well, these are the issues are you willing to work on them? Are you willing to mitigate them? You know, by the grace of God, we gave our own as an example. God can pull this through. Saints, do you know that she did not move? Because she had already made up her mind that she was not going back to that marriage. Even though from our perspective, it was not irredeemable. So in that case, we knew that her mind had become a stronghold, had become a barrier. She was not going back. And so we have to be careful. That can apply to other situations. Sometimes you choose not to forgive people, but you're not perfect yourself. You've done things to other people where they chose to forgive you. So don't allow your mind to become a stronghold and prevent you from earning or moving in the direction that God wants you to move. As we progress, I, I want us to look quickly at four areas or four types of transformation this morning. And I'll just spend a few minutes on each one of them. We have physical transformation. We talked about living and eating healthy. I will talk about marital, and if you're not married, you can substitute that with relational transformation. We talked about how to handle relationship, how to believe the best in people, how to be slow to speak, how to be quick to listen, how to be slow to anger. You know, many of us, including myself, sometimes when we're talking with our spouses, we're listening so that we can defend ourselves. You know, so you, you need to begin to listen so that you can look inwards and see how you can improve yourself. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about financial transformation, how you have to, continue, you have to save for a rainy day and for retirement. And thank God for Dickie Navy when he was teaching us about the importance of habits on Tuesday. You know, you have to unlearn some habits as you develop new habits. I'll give you an example when we get into that particular uh, section. And then we are going to talk about spiritual transformation, knowing God more, leading a, a mature Christian life. Uh, being more tolerant about people. Control our emotions. You know, sometimes your, your mouth is running. Having unconditional love for other people. So, so it's, let's quickly look at these four areas of transformation. Physical transformation. Now, this is very pertinent for this time of the year. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20 says, don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God 
with your body. And of course, the question you have to ask ourselves is, how do we honor God with our body? We honor God with our body by taking care of it. Your body is a temple. You have to take care of your body. Now, it's interesting uh, because I, by the grace of God, I, I go to a gym regularly. And I notice that the beginning of every year, uh, maybe because we, we just come uh, finished Thanksgiving in November, and then before we can recover from Thanksgiving, then we also have Christmas. So many of us, we are kind of overindulged. And then you get on the scale and you say, the devil is a liar. <laughs> the devil is not a liar when you are eating the food. It's only when you get on the scale that you think the devil is a liar. And you say, well, I'm going to do something about this weight this year. Glory be to God. And then you decide that either you embark on a, a diet, maybe keto diet, no carbs, low carbs, nutri system, and then because you want to be aggressive, not only do you embark on the diet, you also say, well, let me join this gym. I, I drive past this gym regularly and, you know, let me just go there. And many of the gyms, they are very smart. They have specials in January. Do you know why? Because they want new customers. They don't, those new customers, typically, they don't come back by March. But you continue to pay your $30 or $20 every month because you hope that you'll come back. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. And that's why I said that a successful Christian transformation requires discipline and consistency. So in January, everywhere is busy. The gym is busy. You know, your weight is coming down. But by February, your commitment begins to wane because life happens. And then the, you say sometimes the food you're eating, you're eating salad or you're eating this thing, uh, things that rolls and all that. But you say, well, I, I prefer to eat. Uh, I'm from a kitty, so I prefer to eat swallow. I, <laughs> and then you, you go back on your, uh, on, on your promises and your commitments. And, you know, Matthew 26, the 41 says, your spirit is willing, but the body becomes weak. And that's why when we talk about physical transformation and any of this other transformation, it is the discipline and consistency that allows you to be victorious. And I pray that you shall be victorious in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that the grace to be consistent with your New Year resolutions in all these areas of transformation, that the Lord will grant it to you in Jesus' mighty name. And some of us have a sweet tooth. And we love ice cream. But I, may I suggest that if you are trying to lose weight, maybe you shouldn't go to a, a buffet type of restaurant. Hello? Because whenever you go to a buffet restaurant, you tend to over it because they taste so good. So one of the things you can do is to begin to go to a la carte, where you order the plate. Usually something is as expensive, many times even more expensive than the buffet, the Chinese buffet and all that. But then you are training yourself to make sure that when God says you honor him with his body, that you are taking care of your body. You do your annual checkup. You do your medical checkup. You make sure that your blood sugar is in line. You make sure that if you have to take supplements, you take your vitamins, you do your exercise. And one thing that I discovered that's actually very helpful, if you walk regularly around your neighborhood, maybe 20, 30 minutes, couple of times, three to four times a week, that is also a start. So you don't have to join a gym in order to begin to have a, a, a physical exercise. And I dare say it's very important that whatever you choose to do, you must enjoy it. Because if you don't enjoy the exercise, if you don't enjoy the food, then saints, after some time, you begin to draw away from that. So choose something that you enjoy. Choose the form of exercise that you enjoy. Of course, it's difficult to choose the type of food that you enjoy because those ones are typically uh, very high in calories. But my prayer for each of us is that the Lord will give us the grace to follow through our commitments for healthy living in Jesus' mighty name. Let's look at the second area of transformation, which is marital or relational transformation. 
James 1 19 says, You must all be quick to listen. Somebody say, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. How many of you know if you've been married for more than a minute that you will not always agree with your spouse? No matter how angelic your spouse is, there will always be areas of differences. And if you're not married, you have friends that you are close to, you'll always have areas of opinion differences. And just like I said, many times when we're in disagreement with our spouses, because we know they are not perfect, we live with them, whenever they try to correct us or criticize us, instead of listening to see maybe what he or she is saying is correct so I can improve, we're listening to see how we can defend ourselves. Oh, am I the only one? Because I, I want to defend myself when my wife says something, I, I look at, you know, what she's not doing right. I say, how about you? In this area, you can also improve. But what I should do is to take that criticism, control my emotions, process it, and say, well, how can I improve myself? And if you all have that attitude, you know, of being slow to talk and quick to listen, perhaps some of those outbursts that we have, some of those things that we say that we hurt each other, we begin to say less of them. If you're always looking to defend yourselves, I promise you, you're always going to, likely to put up a wall and half the thing your spouse is saying, you're not even listening because you can't wait to defend yourself. You know, Psalm 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. My prayer for each one of us is that in our marriages, that we shall be still this year in the name of Jesus. You know, when our spouses bring out the things that upset us, some will be valid, others will not be valid. And of course, let me just throw this in. It's not everything that you see in your marriage that you criticize. Amen? There are some things that you see that you take, you correct. There are some things so that when you are now talking to your spouse, they see that, okay, you know, it's not every time that we have a, a session or sit down to watch a movie that you are talking and criticizing. There are things that you know, so that's all I'm saying is choose your battles carefully. You don't have to point out everything that is wrong in your spouse because you yourself, you are not perfect. And the Lord will grant you that wisdom in Jesus' mighty name. This is the year to ask for the grace to be quiet and to be more mature. This is the year to believe the best in your spouse, to believe the best in your colleagues, to be more tolerant, to, be, to, be, to make a concerted effort, to be a peacemaker in your home. Something that really got me is that sometimes when I, I do argue with my wife, and even when I'm wrong, and she makes peace, it kind of upset me because I'm a pastor. <laughs> and I think, well, I know I'm wrong, so why is my wife making peace? And over time, you know, I, I then realized that, you know, my wife is not preaching on the pulpit, but she's preaching at home. And therefore, then I, I realize that even when she's wrong sometimes, I make an effort to make peace. That should be your attitude. That even when you're right, you make peace. You make peace in the home. Your home should be a house of joy, a house of peace. Your relationship should be a relationship that you value. But you say, Pastor, my spouse knows how to push my button. How many of you, I mean, don't raise up your hand. Of course, he or she knows how to push your button. You live together. And there's some things that will never change. Hello? You see, there, there are some things that God will allow to test you in your lifetime. Either with your spouse, your close friend. But this Christian life is not an easy walk. It's not a walk in the park. So every day, that's why the Apostle Paul says, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I endured to the end. There's, I'm not giving a license for people now to not change. I'm just saying that inevitably there are some things you have to overlook in your marriage. Otherwise, you will not be at peace. The Lord will give you the grace to be tolerant in the mighty name of Jesus. The Lord will give you the grace to be the peacemaker in your home in the name of Jesus. The Lord will give you the grace to be one that's improving your relationship, stepping out the more mature one, always seeking peace in Jesus' mighty name. Let's look at the next 
transformation as I begin to close. Uh, it's financial transformation. And listen to these things. Proverbs 13, 8. Proverbs 13, 8. It says, if you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. I pray that none of us will end up in poverty and disgrace in the name of Jesus. But I know, and I look at a few principles under this financial transformation. Uh, the first one I, I, I put up there is that God is the source of everything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says, My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Psalm 24, it says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, everything that lies in it. So if God is your source, why do you find it so difficult to honor God with your substance? Uh, you know, the past two years have been particularly rough in terms of close friends that have passed away from COVID and other you know, unrelated things. I have a good friend, uh, I think it was early 2021. He was a big guy and he had made a concerted effort over five years. He had lost over 30 pounds. So on his health journey, he was actually on a good curve. And there was one day last year, I was walking in a park in London, talking to somebody on the phone and then all of a sudden he said, oh, I'm feeling weak. Let me call you back. And then he collapsed in the park. And it, by the time the ambulance came, he died. He was just 59 or, or something like that. Last year, we lost two close friends, pastors, to COVID. And I'm thinking that if we really understand and grasp the perspective that everything we have of everything we hope to be is provided through the providence of God, then our perspective to given will be different. Our perspective to doing the things of God is different. God is the source of everything you have. If you are down for a day, then you realize that all your wealth is immaterial. The most important thing that you want to get back is your, your health. But then once we get back on our feet, we look at our beautiful homes, we look at our cars, we look at our 401ks, we look at our businesses, and I pray it's not like the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar, and we begin to believe that we did this all by ourselves. Saints, when it comes to financial transformation, the first thing you have to realize is that God is the source of everything you have and everything you can hope to have. And that's a segue into the second point that given is essential. You give to honor God. Just like the Bible says, how do we honor God with our body? We take care of it. How do we honor? How do we reciprocate honor to God? It's with our giving. Many times, Bishop is coming up here to remind us of the building project, to remind us of, of things that we need to do in the ministry. He's trying to cajole us. He's trying to you know, encourage us, which is what, what we should be doing. But I, I sit back and say, sometimes it's as if we don't understand that without God, we are nothing. Without God, we don't even have, you know, all these things that we value will not be there. So, saints, when you realize that God is the source of everything, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says God loves a cheerful giver. If somebody has to manipulate you, somebody has to cajole you, somebody has to encourage you all the time in order to, for you to give towards the work of God, then your perspective is, is not right. So when it comes about transformation, I told you where the mind goes, not only does the body go, your money will also go. The Lord will open your minds in Jesus' mighty name. When we look at financial transformation, there's another one. It says, save for a rainy day and for retirement. Do you know that some people, their jewelry, their bags, their shoes, their cars, they're much more valuable than their retirement account? Hello? All those things they have 
stuck in their closet on their rooms, when they value everything, he's much more than what they are saving for their retirement. How can that be? How can that be that the things you are collecting in your home is more than what you are saving for your future? I'm not saying don't look good. No. Good things are good. You should look good. But don't spend to try to impress other people. They're not impressed. One of the principles which we've been told and uh, Osse and, and the team, you have to have savings of at least four to six months of your expenditure. But some of our people, instead of saving, anytime Macy does sales or Louis Vuitton, they go back to buy not just shoes but matching bags. They go back to buy jewelry. There are some people, they have up to 10 wristwatches. How many wristwatches can a person wear? Your clothes, you have different colors, you have different things. You have to take care of your finances, saints. You have to take care of your savings. You have to have a retirement. You have to have, make sure your retirement account is much greater than all the bags. Even if you look at the cars that you have, maybe your, only your house can be more valuable. Every other thing should be secondary to the value of your retirement account. The Lord will give you wisdom in the mighty name of Jesus. Proverbs 21, 20 says, The wise have wealth and luxury. But listen to this. In NLT it says, But fools spend whatever they get. Fools, they spend whatever they get. May that not be your portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Keep out of debt. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich, they will rule the poor. So the borrower is always a servant to the lender. Don't borrow beyond your income. If somebody says there's a wedding and you need to buy Ashwabi, if you don't have it, say, can I buy the gele? Hello? And if you don't have money in that month for the gele, say, what color is the gele? If it's gold, I have a shade of gold in my closet. Are you with me? <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Don't borrow beyond your income. Don't try to impress people. Proverbs 37, 21 says, The wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly, they are generous givers. And with this one, the final one in this uh, financial transformation that I like is contentment. Somebody say contentment. Do you know the opposite of contentment? Long truth. Long truth is the opposite of contentment. Long truth means everything you see, you think you must have it. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, it says godliness with contentment is what? It's great gain. For we came into this world with nothing and we will live with... I'm, I'm not saying don't look good. I like to look good. I like my wife to look good. But I'm happy with what God has blessed me with. Some people, they will buy a new car. Before they get home, they will be looking at another man's car and say, God, next year, I claim that car in the name of Jesus. Even the car you just bought, you haven't taken it home. You just moved to a four-bedroom house in, in Katy, and you went to somebody that has an eight-bedroom in, in, in an estate. You say, I claim this eight-bedroom in the name of Jesus. Yes, you can aspire to greatness. But saints, can you try to be contented with what you have? After all, you started in an apartment when you came to Houston, and God has elevated you. God has changed your job. God has moved you up. Without contentment is long truth. You are not satisfied with where you are. You are not transformed. The Bible says the love of money is the root of what? All evil. Because until you meet up with the Joneses, you are not happy. You are not contented. The Lord will give you wisdom in Jesus' mighty name. Do you know if you are trying to save money and you keep spending frivolously, you can't meet your target. That's why we talk about unlearning bad habits while developing good ones. You have to stop spending frivolously. Now you set aside money every month from your account into your retirement, into your savings. You save for a rainy day. 
The last area of transformation that I'm looking at, the fourth one, is spiritual transformation. Maturity, areas of anger, controlling our emotions, controlling our tongue, exhibiting more fruit of the Spirit. So I start this section and says, the Holy Spirit provides the enablement for all types of transformation. But there's a responsibility. Somebody say responsibility. There's a responsibility on the part of every believer. There's a responsibility on every part of every believer. You know, some pastors will quote, without me, you can do nothing. Yes, that's what the Holy Spirit says. But the Holy Spirit says, if you remain in me, and I also remain in you, then you shall be what? You shall be fruitful. How many of you know that God is not unjust? But do you know that even every believer will be judged? There are two types of judgment. The great white throne judgment for unbelievers and the judgment for believers. So why would God be judging you if everything depends on the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is an enabler. Somebody say enabler. He enables you. He puts the power available to you. It's up to you to tap into that power. On the day of judgment, I hope some people will not be saying, I was waiting for the Holy Spirit to move. Just as you are waiting for the Holy Spirit, you know, Acts 1, it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come up to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. It's talking about the power has been released unto you as a believer. So stop using the Holy Spirit as an excuse not to transform. No, stop using the Holy Spirit as an excuse to say, my tongue can, is, is being controlled by something else. Stop using the Holy Spirit as, a, as an excuse to curse out people. Stop using the Holy Spirit as an excuse to continue to eat the way you want. The power for change, for maturity, is already released unto you. The grace to tap onto it depends on you. And the Lord will grant it to you in Jesus' name. That's why in 1 Peter 1, 13 says, So prepare your minds for action and exercise God self-control. What is your proof of being a believer? What is your proof of God's word remaining in you? Saints, it's your obedience. The Bible says, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And then in that scripture in James, it says, deceiving only yourself. If you are waiting on the Holy Spirit to move, you are deceiving yourself because that power has already been released unto you. It's just to ask for the grace to continue to improve. James 1.20 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in all he does. John 15, 5 says, Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, which means it's a partnership. The Holy Spirit provides the enablement. He provides the power for you to do it, but it's up to you to actually walk in it. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. You shall step out in faith. In that verse 7 on John 15, it says, but if you remain in me, which means your obedience is complete, and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted unto you. Saints, your proof that God's word remains in you is your obedience, which translates into the fruit 
of the Spirit, which is a proof of being transformed. It starts with obedience. It starts with surrender. Many of us, I ha we have what I call selective obedience. We obey God when it's convenient. When it's not so convenient, we write off the rule. We say, well, I'm still a work in progress. May the Lord give us the grace to be consistent in our obedience. In the name of Jesus. If you look at the closing points for today, before that, Matthew 7, 20 says, yes, you can identify a tree by its fruit. So you can identify people by their actions. Saints, I've said quite a few things this afternoon. But one thing, as I recap on what we've discussed, is that successful transformation requires discipline and consistency. It's not a three-month project. It starts when you give your life, but it's actually a lifelong project. We continue to walk day and day, precept by precept. We take walks. We improve. And if you're honest with yourself, you know when you're making progress. Maybe before, if somebody crosses you when you're driving on the road illegally, you before maybe you cast them out but in your mind now if it happens you say it is well then you tell yourself i know i'm saved i'm a work in progress or somebody believes a lie about you and they judge you and they call you up and they say nasty things and then you keep quiet you remember be still let god defend me you put the phone down and say yes i know i'm saved just like when people walk into their homes and they can't believe because the developer has transformed the home. The dining room is changed. The bedroom is more glamorous. The kitchen is sparkling and modern. Everything looks good. Saints, you should also be able to see improvement. You should be able to see progress in every area of your life as you are back on this journey. I told you that physical transformation is we honor God with our body. Marital transformation, relational, we control our emotions. This is the year to be slow to speak. Even when you are right, we should be quick to listen. We should be more tolerant of things. This is the year when our finances should be in order. Stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. Remember, godliness with contentment is great gain. There are people whose prayer point is just to have a life like you. Yes, you continue to look forward. Yes, you should aspire to great things. You should reach for the stars. You should have great vision. But as you pass through the journey of life, every stage you are, I want you to know, I appreciate God. Say, thank God for what you have given me. I'm moving higher. He says, the path of the just is like a shining light that shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. My tomorrow is going to be better than my today. But thank God I have the spirit of contentment. I'm happy with where God has taken me. And then we looked at spiritual transformation with the understanding that the Holy Spirit provides the enablement. It provides the grace, the power for us to change. But we are partners in this process because there's a judgment awaiting every believer and we are given our rewards. And we can't say we were waiting for the Holy Spirit to change us, to make us to do the work. No. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 6, he said, I fought a good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my race. My prayer for each and every one of us this morning is that you will fight the good fight of, of, of faith, that you will finish well in the mighty name of Jesus, and that you will remain faithful up unto the end. So nobody's portion will be Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. It will be, welcome, my servant. Welcome, my daughter. Welcome, my son. So, let's just close our eyes for a few minutes. I want you to pray to God. Father, in this journey, the transformation that we have been talking about, oh God, whether it's physical transformation, I'm struggling with my weight, I'm struggling with my health, I'm struggling with the food. I just have a desire, I have a sweet tooth. 
I eat the things that don't necessarily be the best for me. Grant me the grace, O oh God, help me, Lord. In my marriage, O oh God, let me be the peacemaker, Lord. Not just a title in church. Let me be the peacemaker. Let me be the peacemaker. Let me be the builder of home, O oh God, in my marriage, in my relationship with other people, Lord. In the area of finances, ask the Lord, grant me the grace to have a spirit of saving and preparing for my future, for my retirement, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Being able to save for a rainy day. Being able to accumulate well. The Bible says you shall be lender unto nations. Impulsive spending, Father, remove it from me. Frivolous spending, remove it from me, O oh God. And finally, spiritual transformation. Holy Spirit, let me surrender to your will, O oh God. Lord, let me be an AMFM Christian. I'm in one day, I'm out the other, doing my own will. The grace to do your will, to be consistent, to be disciplined. The Apostle Paul says, I discipline myself so that I won't preach to others. I will not be disqualified. Father, let me not be disqualified in the name of Jesus. All my flaws help me, Lord. We all have flaws. We are all a work in progress. That God will help us on a daily basis. But let my progress be apparent to all. Let my spouse be able to just smile and inwardly think, oh, my husband has changed. My wife has changed. Let my children find peace in the home instead of argument in the home. I may come to church with a mask looking good and then go back and the home is like a war zone. Let there be peace in my home in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. Let my mind be set on things above, not things on earth. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. I also have one quick duty to do this afternoon. Um, we lost two people this week. I don't know whether Pastor Ola is still around. His mother passed on to glory at the age of 84. So I, please, I think he, he notified us in the pastorate yesterday. So we're going to pray for him. Now just a short prayer. But of course, I charge you uh, to continue to lift him up and please reach out to him to encourage him. No matter how old our parents get, you know, we still feel that it's never enough, even if they get to over 100. I also particularly lift up, his father is still alive, he's 93. So we're going to pray for him as well, that the Lord will comfort and strengthen him. And then one of our members, Sister Lisa Amosu, she lost her brother-in-law. I don't have details about the particular uh, circumstances, but I know that she lost somebody close to her. So since I just want you to lift up those two families this afternoon, that the Lord will extend peace to them like a river. The Lord will comfort them. The Lord will give them beauty for ashes a garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness, the oil of joy instead of mourning. The Lord will fortify them. Let's particularly hold up Mr. Davis, Pastor, last father, that even at this tender age of 93, he will have reason to continue to live, motivation to live. He will continue to develop and deepen his relationship with God. Let's pray for Sister Lisa's brother-in-law, that the gap left behind, that the father, God will be a father for those that have been left behind in the name of Jesus. The Lord will strengthen them. The Lord will be a shield to them. And as we round up our prayer, let's pray for our church, for every member of this church. We shall not lose any of our members to whatsoever form of sickness or illness. It's out there, whether it's COVID or non-COVID. The Bible says those who trust in the Lord shall be like Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. Let's pray for a shield of protection around every family, from the youngest to the oldest, because we're all exposed one way as we go out. Nobody can stay in the house forever. Let's ask the Lord to build our immune system. Father, we thank you, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. We decree long life is our portion, Lord. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen.